A very warm welcome to you all who have joined us to celebrate the launch of Kevin Treston's Choices of Life, the Beatitudes for Daily Living. In doing so, we hope you'll gain some further insight into why Garrett Publishing is so honoured to bring Kevin's thoughts to the wider community on how God's revelation in Jesus and the spirit may be celebrated and communicated in a secularised world in which we live our busy lives. We are recording this evening's event and we will provide a link to the recording to all who register and indeed the wider community from next week. My name's David Hewan and I have the privilege of being part of the Garrett Publishing team. I wish to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I join you from their land this evening in Nam, now known as Melbourne. Uh, we've allowed a little time later in the evening for a Q&A. Please place your questions in the Q&A facility on your Zoom screen. Despite our best efforts, we often find ourselves short of time with these Q&As. I'll do my best to moderate your questions and have uh, Kevin and Anne do their best to respond. Um, that's enough from me. I'd like to introduce our fabulous speakers for tonight. They're really the stars of the show. Um, tonight, of course, we celebrate another of Kevin's gifts to the church and to the faith-filled communities that surround it. Kevin's been involved in ministry for over 60 years and worked in many countries. I could, many, I could mention many honours and achievements that Kevin has, but that would possibly take up the full hour that we have tonight. But shortly, a PhD from Notre Dame in the US, postdoctoral studies with Loyola in Chicago and Catholic University of America in Washington, and many, many more. Uh, he has an Order of Australia for his outstanding services to Catholic education and to the church. He has a storied career as a writer too, and we're so glad that he chose to work with Garrett Publishing on this new book. Before we hear from Kevin, we'll hear from Anne Benjamin. Anne has 50 years of experience in teaching administration, leadership, governments, and consultancy in, high, in education, higher education and church across Australia, Tonga, Papua New Guinea, New Zealand, and India, and I've probably missed a few other countries. Like Kevin, Anne has an extensive CV, including a PhD in uh, religious education, Masters in Leadership, and in, is an honorary professor at ACU, and is so giving her time to Garrett Publishing, for which we are eternally grateful. Um, Anne's authored uh, All This Time, Reflections on Jesus, and Leadership in a Synodal Church, most recently, both available from Garrett Publishing. Now, that is enough for me. I'm in the background, um, but... Uh, I'm going to hand over to Anne. Um, Anne, welcome, and thanks for joining us tonight. And uh, over to you to short to share your thoughts on Kevin's choices for life. Thank you, David, and, and good evening, everyone. Um, David, I reiterate, reiterate your acknowledgement of the custodians of the countries from which we gather this evening. I'm speaking from the land of the Darug people in Western Sydney. In an age when those who deny science, who deny the warnings of a climate catastrophe, find megaphones, and the uninformed outshout the carefully informed, at a time when some church voices see only evil in our world and where the powerful seem intent to divide and separate, in a world where some institutions, religious and otherwise, continue to disenfranchise people on grounds of gender, race, ability, whatever, and where power brokers permit the ongoing slaughter of children, women and men, in such a time, it is a joy to be asked by Kevin to speak tonight about his latest book. Because Kevin is none of these. Kevin is not a denier, but a respecter of science. He's certainly extremely well-informed. 
He seeks the good in the world and finds in its development life-giving signs of the spirit. He cherishes the connectivity between all in creation and respects all persons in an inclusive way. And he is a person who loves justice and has a deeply nourished spirituality of compassion. Thank you, Kevin and Garrett, for this opportunity to celebrate your work. It is reassuring to speak about choices for life, the Beatitudes for daily living, and launch it into our world and our times. Kevin, as David has said, has an OAM and has been sharing his wisdom through teaching and writing for over 60 years. Keep going, Kevin. Don't give up yet. Throughout this time, he has sustained an ad admirable and staggering thirst for fresh knowledge and insight. He's brought the fruit of this thirst to this book. His commitment to uncover new understandings and to share them in a very readable fashion is a remarkable gift, the same word that David used, and he's given it to so many searchers over many decades. No less so in this, his 32nd book, I believe. Written in the 89th year of his life, which amongst many other things has been the life of someone who was, is, and will be a forever educator. Kevin cannot keep himself from teaching, always wanting to share from his vast reading and reflection, always, I find, in a very accessible way. In the interests of transparency, I, I have a disclosure to make. The 2024 is also the 52nd year of our friendship. I was a child at the time. In late August 1972, Kevin had just completed his doctorate in religious education at the University of Notre Dame, Indiana, and somehow he heard that a young Australian woman had arrived on campus. She was on her own, knowing absolutely no one. At 6.30 one morning, the phone in my room rang. It was Kevin, reaching out to welcome and support me. 6.30 a.m., no doubt, was late for Kevin. He'd probably read a book or two and completed all his household hold chores for the day by then. It was a little early for a 20-something-year-old, but his solicitude was warm and palpable. I share this because I recognise it as typical of Kevin, attentive to people, attentive to place, attentive to context. These characteristics are again evident in this Kevin's latest book. Both parts of the title, Choices for Life, The Beatitudes for Daily Living, are significant, and I think he honours the title most assiduously. Structured around the eight Beatitudes as found in Matthew's Gospel, he presents a series of reflections on each beatitude, following a format of brief commentary, selected quotes, and questions for readers' personal reflection. The quotes themselves tap into rich sources, our scriptures, Julian of Norwich, Meister Eckhart, Thomas Berry, Thomas Merton, Teresa of Avila, a North American Indian proverb, and so on. The book concludes with three poems from Noel Davis on blessings of creation. The commentaries on each beatitude reveal Kevin as a person who has integrated the elements of his life into his faith, or is it his faith into his life? From the domestic tragedy of a loved pet's death to world issues of war and poverty, and the crisis facing Earth. The separate chapters on each beatitude offer practical and informed wisdom in a voice that is reflective and sees the connectedness of each of us with the physical wor world and with the cosmos. The book is deceptively simple, and it's enriched by Kevin's long life of reading, teaching, thoughtfulness, 
and prayer, which come through so strongly. Kevin contextualizes his reflections on each beatitude in nine opening chapters, which I found quite fascinating. These are the premises which he brings to his reading of the Beatitudes and on which he builds his reflections. It, this framing of his book is a courtesy to us as readers and also one which certainly expanded my background. For example, I, I would have expected to have read something about the kingdom or the reign of God, but it's the first time I have read the Beatitudes in the context of quantum physics and modern science, or of the connectivity of everything. Throughout the book, these contextual themes keep re-emerging, illustrating their significance to the author. The chapters tell us much about Kevin himself. One of the things I particularly value about his writing in this book, as in earlier ones, is his willingness to name things directly and not settle for pro forma comments or the right answers. For example, in the opening words of the introduction, we, re we read that the Beatitudes are not a series of Christian doctrines. Good. They are faith expressions of how God wants us to live. And in case we missed it, good teacher that he is, Kevin reiterates, the Beatitudes are not intended as a compendium of the dimensions of Christian life and dogmatic teachings. They offer a vision. In a later chapter, he writes about the extraordinary happenings that have happened in the history of the church, especially how the core teaching of Jesus about the reign of God has become marginalised or at least obscured by a church focus on doctrinal orthodoxy. Or again, he speaks of the historical contradiction, how throughout the 2000 years of uh, governance in the church, the church has persecuted faith members for their beliefs. Such honesty I find refreshing. Kevin writes in a positive and open way to science, to technology and the complexities of our societies. I suspect it didn't occur to him to reject them or take a stance over against the world as so often comes through in some church language and people. It is a book that while being very mindful of human brokenness and shortcomings, still loves the world. Far from rejecting the contemporary world or taking a negative view of it, Choices for Life seeks out the presence of the Spirit of God and of wisdom within it. This seems a, a godly stance to take and an incarnational one. Along with his awareness of the cosmic interconnectivity of all things, Kevin's reflections are permeated with a sensitivity to the wisdom of Indigenous peoples. And in case we might have wondered, he leaves us in no doubt about his position on inclusion. Gender discrimination is simply alien to the essential spirit of the Beatitudes. From time to time, I was surprised by the loveliness of sentence, sentences such as this one. The wilderness of mourning can strip away the superfluous. That made me stop. The wilderness of mourning, that in itself was so strong, can strip away the superfluous. Or can sorrow make us better people? We all know how sorrow certainly makes us feel that we're forever changed. But Kevin's question is, are we changed as better people? It takes discipline to write short, comprehensible and insightful chapters. Give some of us a pen or a laptop and we will happily grab it on. Thank you, Kevin, for faithfully sticking to that discipline throughout, making the book extremely useful, not just for individual reflection, but also for small group reflection, such as in parishes, staff groups, Formation, formation for those in governance or on pastoral councils. 
Choices for Life has emerged from Kevin's long experience, deep reading and honest reflection. In its invitation to readers to connect the Beatitudes of the Gospels with the Gospel in our daily lives and the realities of our technological, creation-threatened, secular society, I think it is very much a book for our times. It's pertinent too for a church that has been called to imagine a different way of being. Essentially, at its heart, Pope Francis's call to conversion for the church to become more synodal is a call for us to connect more dynamically or intrinsically with the God revealed in the Gospels, to be enlivened in our discipleship in a way that changes us, turns us around. In this spirit, I would like to conclude by highlighting an invitation that Kevin offers us, an invitation to imagine, to be open, to change, to appreciate the depth and radical nature of the Beatitudes, he writes, we might well let our imaginations recreate a different world that will illuminate something of who the divine source might be. Another one of those sentences that had me pause. Then there is the rather sobering declaration when he writes that the virtues that pertain to the reign of God will become more embedded in our consciousness and spirituality only when we are prepared to do the tough slog of paying the price of persecution for our commitment to the Beatitudes. Kevin knows very well from personal experience the price of such commitment. Finally, I congratulate the good people at Garrett for doing what you do so well and have done for decades taking manuscripts and turning them into in inviting and beautiful books. This is indeed such a beautiful book. I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the generous and prophetic leadership that you at Garrett continue to take in furthering a church more in tune with the spirit of Vatican II, which is finding expression in synodality. From wherever he sits in heaven, with or without his pipe, Garrett's founder, Gary Eastman, must be smiling down on your initiatives in this regard. It is with great pleasure I launch Choices for Life, the Beatitudes for Daily Living. I congratulate you, Kevin, David, Karen, and all who have been involved with making this book available to us as readers. I commend it to anyone seeking to live a more virtuous life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. And uh, what a blessing a 52-year friendship is. And uh, isn't it amazing how the Holy Spirit connects people um, and that spirit um, and that connection is, is lifelong. Um uh, it, it's it, you know it's a that, that's such a beautiful thing in itself. Um, uh, so you're so lucky, both of you, um, and thank you very much. And we do hope uh, Gary's looking down at us uh, uh, and on us, and and uh, uh, everything that we do, you know, we do reference uh, Gary as a uh, in our in our in our everyday thoughts. So uh, thank you for that. Kevin, I tell you what, you've got a very hard um, act to follow there. Um, no question about it. Welcome, um, uh, Kevin, um, and uh, 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 welcome to Queensland. You're, you're a little bit behind the times, of course. It's a little earlier for you than than some of the other people uh, around. Um, but uh, you might like to respond uh, to Anne and, and some insights. But before I hand over to you, I'm going to encourage everybody to make a comment uh, or if you have a question, please feel free to put them in the Q&A or indeed just the chat. 
your questions will be anonymous and I'll do my best to moderate and uh, we'll see if Anne and, and Kevin can uh, uh, share their thoughts uh, uh, with our audience. Audience participation is very important. Kevin, over to you. Um, as I said, you've got a very uh, tough act to follow there. You're Thank on. you. Yep. Thank you, David, very much. <clears throat> As uh, David and Anne, I to acknowledge our first people and their heritage and uh, the place where we are. And I'm conscious of that every time. Well, I want to thank you very much, um, David and um, Karen, and uh, of course, Garrett Publishing. Uh, I've been so touched by your joy, have been a joy to work with, and also um, the again and again people have commented on the high quality of the presentation of the book. So all praise to you. <clears throat> what can I say about you, Anne? Yes, all those 50 years I remember so clearly and in October 1972 when this young woman arrived from distant Australia into Notre Dame. And I'm deeply touched by what you said tonight. Thank you, Anne, so much. There's so much I could say, but uh, I'll leave that for another time, except to acknowledge <clears throat> my gratitude for you tonight and also admiration for you with your distinguished, uh, you know, distinguished time in which you have shared your expertise with so many people. Uh, thank you so much for that, Anne. Well, that uh, leads me to reflect a little bit on my book. Um, it arose out of um, increasing concern I have of how a wonderful Christian story is there, but is not so accessible, some aspects of it particularly. I mean, we hear about... Um, beliefs about Jesus, but to what degree do we encounter Jesus? That's the question. And I wanted to write something that was very ecumenical. Uh, and I felt the eight Beatitudes was an extremely ecumenical uh, way of addressing some of the great questions in our society. The great questions of the society in which there are divisions and prejudices and all kinds of uh, uh, disputes and so on. Surely God would want the something about a oneness that would bring us together. And the more I looked at the eight Beatitudes, and you'd be aware that as scripture scholars would say, they were probably spoken at all different times. Matthew brings them all together um, uh, to the uh, to put them nicely together. Um, and there they are as a way of how we might live. And that's the question of the attitudes. They're for everybody. When we think of the Upanishads, the Hindu and the Eightfold uh, Noble Truths of the Buddha and uh, Zoroaster and Confucius and Islam and so on. And our first people, too, in Australia here, there are, there's a commonality that flows right through those. But to what degree... Are our people, <clears throat> for, for example, our Christian people, aware that they have this gold mine, this treasure for saying, this is how we might live. And if we're faithful to that, how that would change 
our way of being and doing. So you would be aware that the book has four uh, parts, really. The first part, the introduction, then each of the eight Beatitudes, a small um, description of, of them and more about that later, then a summary, and finally a, a complement with the <clears throat> um, beautiful poems of Noel Davis. But the introduction was very important, I found, and I thought that may be missing in some uh, exposés of the Beatitudes. So without going into detail, let me just quickly go through them. And as mentioned, the reign of God 120 times mentioned in the gospel. Yet when I went to different countries and in 2026, that will be 70 years of public ministry in many countries, um, I found in a way, even though the reign of God, the metanoia, the transformation of consciousness to another way of being and thinking was often not well known. And it was a surprise and disappointment. The Beatitudes, as you well know, the eight Beatitudes sit within this realm and transformation of consciousness. It's interesting that the language of Jesus was Aramaic and the Aramaic for the reign of God is the Aramaic is the reign of unity. And that in itself is a key point that brings the second point that there's a connectivity. There's a, there's a oneness that flows through them all. That's a possibility for everybody. And uh, whether people are churched or not churched or they're, whatever known or whatever they description or whatever religion there's something there for everybody to say how might i live and our first people of course have, in australia have often offered us uh, different ways of doing it so that was important to reign of god and also the universalism of it and the unity and so on another key word was the Greek word makarios. I found that a beautiful word and it flows right through. Makarios is translated in English as blessed are or happy are there. If you look at your Bible, the, often the Beatitudes are happy are, whatever, or blessed are. But the Greek word makarios means it's okay to, it's not a commandment notice. Beatitudes are not commandments. They're ways it's good that you are trying to do that uh so go for it i love that word makarios because sometimes we can be overwhelmed by the, all the strictures or this or don't do that but makarios says go on go for it blessed are you who are having a try and so on i was really glad and and mentioned to a quantum physics because as you know in the last 50 years or so, that's changed so much and increasingly is changing so much of energy patterns because they're the Beatitudes, they sit in a, a way of a, a realms of, of energy. And through uh, the quantum physics, if you, as it, uh, and, and morphic resonance, we draw that into our being. So we have opportunities to enter into the energies of the Beatitudes, and that's important through prayer, through actions, through talking with others, through being challenged, and so on, uh, through the Eucharist and all different ways. Uh, I think the I found the energy patterns of the Beatitudes so important and certainly changed a lot of the ways that I, for example, look at the Eucharist, body and blood of Christ, what that means in terms of quantum physics. But that's another question altogether. There are other things like the inclusive nature, you know, and the whole question of gender 
questions and so on. You're familiar with all, all those. And a lot of other aspects of that. But notice the Beatitudes call us into action. And that was very important. That's why at the end of the uh, chapter, uh, you know, I we can talk forever about be Beatitudes and it's really nice, but actually what actually happens that changes and, and so on. There are other aspects of that uh, that I won't just read the introduction and you'll see the seven or eight aspects that are really important to situate them. Because the Beatitudes are kind of a charter for how communally we may live in. And I suppose one of the other ones I should, going back on introduction, was imagination. You know, in Matthew, what is it, 20, verse 16, it is, isn't it? The last shall be first and the first shall be last. One of the questions, as you know, in following Jesus is there, as we have to think upside down, because, you know, different things. How, how come? It, it was uh, Mary Magdalene in, in John 20, for example. She was the one that was given the resurrection story to tell and so on. I won't go through all those who are familiar with that one. Look at the parables there. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. Why would Zacchaeus, for example, in, in Luke 18, why would he, uh, a, a tax collector, you know what they thought of tax collectors, yet he was the one that was given the hospitality of Jesus in uh, 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 Luke um, 19, verse 1 to 10, and so on. So imagination because some of the Beatitudes uh, can be really tough, you know. Uh, Macarios are the poor in spirit. Well, wait a minute, that doesn't sound too good to me, uh, and so on. So that led me to how do I briefly present eight Beatitudes? And one factor over the years, and mentioned a number of books in the last 50 years, um, I've I've really settled on a, a middle thing and uh, putting it in today's uh, price. It's about, I found about $25 uh, a book for the middle group that I am I try and address. Uh, my books aren't going to grace the halls of the universities, but it's somewhere in the middle. And therefore it meant I was really down to two or three pages on each beatitude, and that presented a real problem. So basically, there were three parts. One, some scriptural background to each of that. Um, secondly, um, a very some very practical things that flow this one. And really, uh, an introduction that at the end of each chapter was uh, a to put their provocative questions because one thing I hope and already I've got evidence of it from seeing some feedback already some people are saying we're going to use this in the school or whatever or groups uh, that we have formed and I'm thrilled because we want people to share and that was the thing uh, you could write forever you imagine you, I suppose, could, and I said he could, on each of the eight Beatitudes, write a book at each one. Easy. They're so powerful, aren't they? But it's a question of how does it impact on me? You know, happy are the poor in spirit or the gentle. Now, at first sight, notice typical of the Beatitudes, you have to go back and think, wait a minute, what, what gentle people, how does that fit? Uh, because that isn't, are you talking about cuddly people who are kind of nice and say nice things? Well, actually, the Beatitude says exactly no. Gentle people have a, stole, a soul of steel too. But they notice being gentle, they give space for people to be and to become. So that's a fundamental question that flows each of the Beatitudes. 
individual, yes, to be the poor in spirit. I need others. I need God. I need Mother Earth to keep me alive. I'd be dead in four or five minutes if I didn't have oxygen come to me every moment of my life. So that was the third aspect of each beatitude. I tried to put a paragraph or two paragraphs just to make sure that each beatitude was woven into the dynamics of us being integral to aspect of creation. You know, we we are with there's a one oneness, there's a oneing in all things. That's why I love that. Uh, 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 thing, the Aramaic, the unity. That's a fundamental question, and quantum physics emphasizes that that everything is one, but it has all sorts of possibilities that flow out from it. And each, I won't go through. That. It's a beatitude. I could spend the rest of rest of the time on that, but my time is moving along. So. When we look at uh, di different beatitudes, uh, we we ask ourselves, what does this mean to me? You know, uh, righteousness, a hunger and thirst after righteousness. What are hunger and thirst for? All sorts of things. Well, Black Friday is coming up tomorrow, so you might be desperate to to go to to one of those. Uh, all sorts of sales that are on now. But what does it actually mean? Because notice each of the Beatitude takes us inside as well as outside, but inside first. So hunger and thirst. Do I really hunger and thirst? Well, actually, we're very fortunate often in our society that not many times do we hunger and thirst for food or drink. Sadly, that's not the situation in in about well, well, at least twenty percent of the world. But that that's uh, the big question. But then, hunger and thirst. So, do I have a passion for this? And how is my passion realized? In in how do I live? Because a key thing of each beatitude is those three things always myself the interior and the exterior to the community, the communal, the relationships. And thirdly, of course, a mother earth, the creation. And each of the be, uh, eight beatitudes, I try to weave very simply. Remember, I ke uh, keep it to just about three or four pages of each one, even though we could go on forever and ever. And that's what I hope will happen in the Beatitudes as people take this book. I think my time is coming towards the end, so I'll just briefly. The third was a summary to bring it together. And a basic thing in that summary, uh, again, reminding us that this is for everybody. We've got issues now of people uh, uh, making, you know, decisions about how they interact based on a very selfish individual and sometimes very emotional. And I remind ourselves that the God of love is calling us back into being. And lastly, just uh, quickly to finish off, I was so touched to be able to use the poems of Noel, who was in my first class in 1956, honour his poetry. They're three beautiful poems, really, about the attitude. So just to draw that together, my time is up, so much I could say, but I was so touched uh, and uh, by Garrett Publishing to publish what they did, I was such a and, and grateful for all those people in my life that have shown me something about the Makarios of living and trying to anyhow live the Beatitudes with the grace of God. Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, and, David. And Kevin, um, we're very grateful. There's hundreds of people on the 
the webinar and we are all in, immensely grateful for not just this book but for the many many books and the works that you've done over the years i'm going to bring um I'm going to bring Anne and yourself together because it's um, audience participation time, which can always um, uh, lead to uh, uh, very interesting um, discussions. In fact, there was an early question from Michael um, who uh, wanted to know about how you link uh, quantum mathematics, uh, actually, um, uh, and unpack the Beatitudes, but you've spoken, um, uh, we don't need to answer Michael's question, it's asked and answered um, before this time uh, when you were talking about the energies that surround the both. Um, uh, now, I'm going to just highlight, there are a couple of people, Kevin uh, and Anne, who came in just a little bit late um, to the session, um, and so um, uh, they just wanted to um, uh, to sort of say, um, um, you know, what spiralled you on the journey to write the book, Kevin? So we might be going over old ground, but for those who came in late, perhaps if we can just ask you that question and, and uh, um, you can respond to that. Well, just quickly... And briefly, and uh, I'll start off negatively, but as I went around to different countries, uh, including Australia, I found a great uh, deficit in the whole uh, apostolic mission of the church, and that was an adult life and faith development. Mm. It was almost as if a, a few people knew and the rest were laity and they didn't. So my passion over the years, uh, and it's, an ongoing passion is for do everything I can towards nurturing and and facilitating adult life and faith education. That's been a basic inspiration. We're all called by our baptism to share the good news, but we need to know, you know, as well as to uh, worship and experience. That's Thank a you. simple answer to a very big question. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. Um, uh, how difficult um, is it to integrate so beautifully um, many aspects of life, emotion and scripture in your writing? And that's asked by Judy. Well, I'll talk, but Anne would be brilliant at this too. It's a big challenge, actually, and I'm glad you that person asked that question because you need to read and pray and talk and so on and engage in a whole lot of different things for example that's why the introduction with those different points were very important i found you know imagination and uh, so on and to different religions to be familiar with those as well as our own uh, our sacred our peoples here, our own first peoples and so on. But in prayer and in study, but also in the giving the conferences, you get so much wisdom from various different people and also just observing and listening uh, to what the heck is going on around us. And surely for a, a person of any faith is to say, where is God in this say? Eh? And the, the oneness of God means I don't uh, focus on that. If I could be negative for a moment, sometimes uh, there's been uh, uh, an emphasis on doctrinal orthodoxy, whatever it is, but that's often, uh, and I'm not uh, denigrating that, but Often the, it's it's about God, about Jesus. But the point is, uh, does it lead to Jesus, mm. to God, to my brothers and sisters and world, to my being part of Mother Earth, eh? Yeah. It's yeah. the two, not just the about. No, I I fully concur, and I'm I'm pretty sure that 
almost everybody on the call would probably appreciate that comment. And would you like to would you like to comment? Because you're a writer as well. Um, and so you know just how hard it is for Kevin to have written the book because you know we you know we were pretty brutal uh, in saying you've only got so many words and you can only say so many things you know Kevin um, uh, but uh, and have you got some thoughts on that just to bring you in as well? Uh, thank you, David. I'll probably sound as though I'm repeating what Kevin has said, but for me, you start with a question or a, a pain or, a, or, or, or something that you or you want to express or want to, und, if it's a knot, you want to undo it or to want to explore it. And yes, um, you, well, the way I do it, I do go and read and try and study and never, ever, ever do enough. But then there's a point where you've got to, I find, I've got to come around the circle and say, no, what was that original question? What was that original hurt, pain uh, that you wanted to, to explore? And come back to what is, I suppose, tr trying to be true and honest. I mean, the easy thing is to write academic stuff. Mm. And, uh, and, and to let the research speak. But I'm only saying what Kevin and you yourself, David, have said. It's coming back and what is at heart the the essence, the, the, the truth, the essence. Now, for us, it, it's our, our search for God. It's our, our search for meaning. Um, in my little Jesus book, it was about what Jesus meant to me. I mean... Um, I did an awful lot of reading and research about that, but it had to come down to me digging, standing back. That time of prayer is terribly important. Um, and then digging in and saying, okay, trying to find that truth for me. I don't know if that's helpful. No, I, I definitely think that it, it, it it is. And, um, you know, we need to make God accessible in our lives. We need to make sure and be open to the Holy Spirit. And, you know, we live so, you know, this, we live such dynamic and crazy and busy lives that, you know, we can easily lose sight of the bigger picture or, as you call it, the pain point uh, uh, or get lost in doctrine, um, which sometimes I think the church likes us to to be lost in in doctrine because um, they, you know, push it down our throats so so regularly, or at least some of the some within the church do. Um, uh, just uh, some theolog uh, Andrew writes some theologians like Jack Marney write that the new evolutionary theology cannot be reconciled with Jesus' blood sacrifice to redeem us from original sin and that the later doctrine should be ditched. Um, you know, is it impossible to find agreement um, with or impossible to deal with um, these two issues? Can they be reconciled? It's a big question. And we've only got a few minutes to answer it, Andrew. So uh, um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll throw it to Kevin uh, and perhaps Anne like, might like to comment as well. It's a big question. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, give me the next 10 hours. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Just, very brief, you know, just very briefly, just a few points. One always sees the ongoing revelation. Everything is evolutionary in, in the whole of the cosmos, right? Everything is evolutionary. We live in a participatory world. That's changing and evolving. And so uh, I, I, with my historical background, I love history. I always like seeing um, every context or doctrine or whatever within the historical context of what, what, why did they say it as they did? For example, the influence of the letter of Hebrews on the whole thing, which I won't go into. But... If we understand that, 
then we kind of not exactly walk to to, uh, to, uh, to different paths, but we always go to the heart of the question, you know, and the blood and the sacrifice and the original sin. We understand Augustine's 350, uh, I'm sorry, 354 uh, and, and, at, and where that came from and why in that context of those people. Then we understand, however, deeply what's trying to get at. The question is, uh, or a basic question is, well, what do we understand, for example, by sin? You know, where was it from? So it, it's important in as I deepen my faith and the God is, I understand in the whole evolutionary consciousness because the divine consciousness is always evolving, always evolving. Yeah. And the so-called truths, if you like, they are always situated in. You can see that without getting too heavy and off the point with the whole patriarchal uh, scene. We know, and I'm sure a lot of the people, probably everyone, this has done a history of patriarchy, where it came from, why it came from, and, and so on, and how it developed, and then it got entrenched in that. We see, and the synodality of the church recently, there are lots of questions, you know, all about that. So um, we understand what is the heart of the question. And there are some basic things like God is love, eh? God is love, first epistle, chapter 4, verse 8 in, in John, eh? God is love. So what does that mean, that experience, and how is that expressed in different ways? Then theology can only be what it is at one time and place. doesn't mean that truths are not, quote, true, but they're put in different ways, and in our evolutionary understanding, we move along there. Not more I could say, but I think uh, re all the people watching this would be aware of this, and Anne would, of course, too. But I, I've often had to battle with that. You know, I remember one group in England, I won't say where, but... For example, I sat down with them and tried to say, because they kept saying, but original sin is the teaching. And then I tried to give them at morning tea, and it was difficult. I remember us having a cup of coffee together uh, to give them a little bit of background of the fourth century, all the debates and why they came and all that there and, and so on. But enough of that. Uh Anne, did you want to mention anything there? or yeah, Just a little bit, uh, David. Um, over the last few years, through the plenary and the uh, various synodal processes and consultations and in various places, um, I, I've had the, the privilege, really, of um, being able to read a lot of the submissions that people have made, and I have sought, sought them out because they, these things are available for for us to go and look at all over the place. And, and marvellous things. There's, there's so much in that about the the, the faith of the, the people, say, in Australia or, or anywhere else, or Catholics and their hopes and their dreams. But there's also a sadness in it for me because there's very mm -hmm. much in those submissions uh, um, a god of fear uh, or... or or the voices of people who don't know the God of Scriptures, who don't know the what what's your word, Marios, the 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 blessedness, Kevin, um, and and I think that's part of our history that we need to be doing some um, makeup work on now. Um, Vatican II, one of the one of the many things in a very complex uh, process, and and not event, uh, experience in the church, was its emphasis on the relational nature and in scripture. And we we had previously had a church that emphasised doctrine at the risk of that, the fact that we didn't even have Bibles in, in our schools and homes. Uh, but that, that Vatican II signalled a very major shift in terms of relationship, discipleship, uh, 
some of those things that Kevin was speaking about. And yet today, 60 years later, we're still in makeup time in terms of uh, understanding as a church or, or understanding the richness of what is our of our heritage. So um, we've got we've got miles to go yet um, in in terms of and that's why Kevin, your book, um, because it's honest when it says things like um, that I quoted some of those things that beatitudes aren't aren't about doctrine. Because what came with that emphasis on doctrine, and those who are as old as I am will appreciate this, is the, the you had a fear that you'd get it wrong. We had to keep giving the right answer. And that's that's not a living faith. That's not a mature faith either. So um, we have a way to go, but the door is wide open and the road is there for us to take. Thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, very conscious of time. I would say that um, uh, there there's quite a number of comments, Kevin, that are um, thanking you very much for this book and the many work and the many years of work that uh, 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 you, you've you've done. Uh, many books that you've written, and you know, there's glowing praise for the book. Uh, so there's obviously some people who have pre-read the book before tonight, and we thank you for that. Um, uh, but uh, uh, there's a couple of questions that unfortunately we're not going to get um, to answer tonight. Um, I'll, I'll share the comments uh, with Kevin and Anne, and uh, perhaps uh, Kevin or Anne might uh, be able to respond in email, and if so, we might be able to answer a couple of questions from Michael and Lisa and a few others that uh, we're just not going to get to. Um, uh, audience participation is 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 always uh, a, a little um, a, a little uh, challenging. You never know whether or not you're going to get one question or five hundred questions. Um, uh, and uh, uh, you you never quite know whether or not um, uh, whether or not you're going to get um, uh, time to uh, to answer all the questions. So um, uh, I want to um, uh, very much acknowledge and thank uh, you, Anne and uh, Kevin, for your participation tonight. I very much. Um, uh, want to thank Kevin for the book. I want to thank Anne for her book on um, uh, on uh, leadership in synodal church. Yes, um, great book, which is a fantastic book. And uh, um, also, um, uh, Anne, you mentioned a book um, that you that you wrote a number of years ago, and uh, I think it was uh, released uh, in or about. Uh, COVID years, which we all like to try to forget. Um, uh, or if, if you're like me, you sort of put the two years of those those two years into a compartment and try not to think about it. Oh, uh, but that, that, that was a book called All This Time Reflections on Jesus. So we will put links to those books um, in the email um, when we send the video um uh, on um, uh, there's no such thing as a free webinar so uh, I ask you here this evening to do your bit in getting Kevin's message out to as many of your friends and your family and loved ones uh, buy a, a copy of the book or two or three or more um, yes it's a shameless plug I know Christmas is coming what a great gift uh, to those that you love um, um, we want to make sure that Kevin's message um, uh, is carried far and wide and that the Beatitudes are as able to guide as many of our lives um, as possible. But uh, we all live in troubled times. We all have our own challenges and the Beatitudes are able to help us, I think. Um, anyway, so that's enough about me. Um, uh, with that, the evening comes to an end. Uh, look for the video and email in your inbox next week. Um, share the video with your family and friends if you like. We want the word to go out 
as widely as possible. Um, and I do also just wish to thank Karen and my team at Garrett Publishing. They put a lot of passion and love and commitment into every book that we publish. Um, and uh, everyone is 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 fantastic, you know, and uh, Choices of Life is a beautiful yes. book. Leadership of Synodal Church is a beautiful book. And many of the other you know, they're all our it's they're all our children. You know, I feel I, I I feel a love, a great love for all of the books that we publish. And I very much thank you to everybody who continues to support Garrett. Thank one you. more one more plug. Um for those of you who uh may not be aware, we start, believe it or not, we start our advent talks again next Tuesday night. So if you haven't registered, uh, we've got the great team of uh uh, from YTU, um, who uh, are going to open up scripture and and open up our Advent journey. So we encourage you to to join that. It's always a very popular series, and I know personally that uh, Chris and the two Marys um, always um, enrich my own um, journey in the lead up to Christmas, so even a couple of hours uh, make a big difference um, in the busyness that is in the lead up to Christmas. So um, so that uh, with that, I wish you all the best and thank you very much, Kevin. And I'll be in touch tomorrow. Um, and thank you so much. Um, many blessings to you all and uh, a good evening.